Welcome to another episode of Positive Solutions for Life. Today's guest is Charles Perry. Charles is a licensed clinical social worker and has been a mental health therapist for over 10 years, working in a variety of different environments, including inpatient psychiatric unit, psychiatric ER, outpatient clinic, private group practice, and in February 2020, he opened his own private practice. Charles specializes in helping men and women overcome anxiety, of obsession, compulsive disorder, and depression. He's a fan of Seinfeld and the New York Mets and the Jets, and he believes sports are a great way for people to connect. So welcome to the podcast, Charles. Hey, thank you. I forgot I wrote all that. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes people are kind of like a little bit surprised about, you know, oh, hearing somebody else talk about yourself, you know, you is, is just a little bit different sometimes. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Sure. So I grew up in New York, grew up in Long Island. And I, um, when I went to school, initially I had no interest in psychology or mental health or anything. I actually went for something called sports management. It's like this very neat kind of thing. And I remember being in my first sports management class and our teacher was like, hey, you guys want to be agents? You want to be general managers? I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah, you got to go to law school for that. <laughs> and so immediately I was like, okay, I don't want to do that. All right, I'm, I got to find something else. So I just I spent about a year trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I think I came across a an episode on some TV show about serial killers and that really interested me just how their mind worked and mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know, so I switched my major to psychology and so that's how I got into the field but you know personally I've struggled with my own uh, social anxiety pretty bad when I was in high school it was really bad in high school mm -hmm. uh, in college my first semester I remember I avoided going to the speech class every cl like I just avoided it until I had to withdraw from the class so and then I finally had to do it in senior year so uh yeah, if you had gotten me when I was 18 years old, I would not be able to do this uh, today. So that's progress. Well, that's good. That experience has been able to, you know, there's yeah. there's some progress here, right? Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So you, you know, that's interesting because I also got into psychology because I like the, you know, the mind, you know, yeah. like how does the mind work? But I never would have guessed, you know, like for myself, you know, like serial killers. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. Like, right. tell me, like, what was that catch? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I've i always been fascinated, I think, in, in ideas about morality and philosophy. Like, I got really into that in, in college. And so trying to understand how people do such disturbing things. But then, you know, as I'm, I remember this documentary, it's kind of vague in my memory now, but, you know, they, they had a, psychi a psychologist on staff. They had like a neurologist even speak up. And they were talking about how not not to shift the blame, but they were basically saying, look, there are reasons why people do this. It's, it's not just like out of thin air, right? There are mm -hmm, biological mm -hmm. reasons. You know, their prefrontal cortex is messed up. And mm -hmm. so all these things like, oh, that, that's kind of interesting, like mm -hmm. something going on here. And so that really got me thinking about just humans and, and society at large, why we do the things we do. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes we're very quick to judge other people, sometimes rightfully so. Other times we should take a pause maybe and say like, oh, well, we don't know. I don't. I don't know what someone else's life has been. And until I've been in their life, I can't really say what I would do if I were them, you know? Right. So that, that idea fascinated me. Yeah. That is kind of interesting because it, we're all similar in the fact that, you know, we have our brains and our brains catch things and our, you know, our thoughts go all over the place. And sometimes there's a, an issue with some of our brain development yes. and, and different things can happen, you know, traumas can happen that can injure our brains, right. you know, chemicals can do different things, yep. but we all have this great, wonderful brain that can do anything, Right. yet some steer one direction, some steer yeah. another, and, and trying to, it's a puzzle yes. to try to figure it out. Yes, it really is. It's a great, it's like a never ending puzzle. And you can look at two siblings from the same exact family and they turn out very, very different. Like mm -hmm. what's going on there, you know? Uh, there, there's biological forces or sociological forces. So it, it, it's interesting. It's almost like an equation to me, you know, trying to figure out right. how does this influence this? And, you know, uh, so that, that's, yeah, that's always been interesting to me. And you've worked in a lot of different env environments, you know, so how do you see the differences like playing out in different environments, you know, you know, whether it's an inpatient or an outpatient, you know, ER visits, how does, how does that play out? That's just really interesting to me as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think when I started on my inpatient unit, 
you know, you, you get this kind of scene from the movies of what it's going to be like, and it's going to be a madhouse and all this stuff. And those are kind of traditional words they used to use. But then you realize you get in there and these are like, you know, people you, you would see day to day. Mm -hmm. People in the psychiatric unit who are just really depressed and they're suicidal. And so mm -hmm. that's why they're there. They're not really much different than me. You know, I'd listen, so, sometimes they would, you know, sometimes their backstory would be awful you know yeah. it'd be really just terrible brutal stuff and other times not so much and and but they were still suffering you know mm -hmm. and so i think sometimes we, you know we look around the world and we see people with a smile on their face and people are there's a lot more going on underneath the surface you know and right obviously in patient you do have people with um, psychosis schizophrenia mm -hmm. that's a very that's a very different world like internal experience and right. that interesting to me both like academically like learning about that mm -hmm. but also understanding what's going on in that person's mind you know right. that, that when someone is psychotic they're, they're actually seeing the world in a different way they mm -hmm. don't see it. so that's you know so I, that was kind of my experience inpatient and then i i had this interesting job um where i was basically working i was like a traveling therapist i guess you would call it and i would okay. go to the homeless shelters okay and, and this was in brooklyn new york and what i realized was uh, a lot of the people that you see let's say on the street who you know we say is like homeless Mm -hmm. A lot of them are suffering mental illness, and that's mm -hmm. a lot of the reason why they're there. Mm -hmm. They have severe schizophrenia, they have severe depression, and mm -hmm. so their brain won't let them get out of their own way. And they're okay. they're not, you know, the traditional, I think, trope of like someone who's homeless is, oh, they're just lazy, they're not working hard enough. And then you look at their lives, you read their history, you look at what they're, and it's like, no, they're actually just su really suffering. Mm -hmm. you know, that was pretty mm -hmm. eye -opening. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's really hard just to, if you see them, you don't know that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I exactly. was just out in Oregon and, you know, we, in the area we were at, we were walking different places and we saw a lot of, you know, homeless that are along the bike routes or the railroad tracks and, you know, they're camped out, but yeah. you, you can't tell, no. you know, by looking at them. And right. that's what the heart, what's hard about mental illnesses is yeah. oftentimes they just look just like you and I, yes. and for us that we say we're normal, exactly. you know, exactly. and you can't tell can't tell it's so true yeah and so it's really hard to to kind of relate sometimes to understand that the lens that they're looking at the world is totally different than ours yeah and it's hard to get past that sometimes right and it and it really like it hijacks their, their whole nervous system their whole body you know it's like they so someone who's really struggling let's say with ptsd or, or even schizophrenia it's like they're not you can't just think your way out of a problem. You know, I think we like to think of ourselves as like these rational beings. And it's like, oh, I have a problem. I'll just think about it and I'll solve it. And the reality is like, we're very emo emotional creatures. We have a nervous mm -hmm. system, just like any other animal. And like, mm -hmm. you look at a dog who's shaking and you go, oh, that dog probably had a bad, tough experience, or maybe they just have some anxiety. Mm -hmm. and for some reason, we have a hard time doing that with humans. You know, it's like yeah. someone's suffering. We go, oh, well, you know, they put themselves in a bad position. It's like, right. Well, it's it's more complicated than that you know it's kind of a simplistic and i think maybe it makes us feel better like oh i i did you know got out of it you right know, but you really know what's going on inside someone's brain and their body you know? yeah yeah so how can we be a little bit more compassionate about it i don't know if you want to use your story of how you know yeah. how did you go from the social anxiety avoiding speech class you know avoiding talking to, you know, now just going out and working with different people in different um, situations, being on podcasts, getting yourself out there. How, I don't know, just tell a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it started slow for me. Like, and I, this is something I, I talk to my clients about. You, it's kind of a trope, I guess, in therapy, the, the, the phrase, meet, meet them where they're at, right? Mm -hmm. yep. I kind of have to do that for myself. Like, as much as when I was in college, I, I, you know, in high school, I wanted to go to parties. The reality was I was so anxious. There's no way I could have done a lot of those things so mm -hmm. at some point i had to say like wow it's hard for me to like go to the deli and order a sandwich like that's a problem mm -hmm. you know and i think you you had a uh, podcast about accountability that i, I, mm -hmm. I, I took a look at, and that was so important for me uh and i think you know i think it's important for people to take accountability and say like as embarrassing as it is as shameful as it might feel it's better to just say i have this problem mm -hmm. let me deal with it you know mm -hmm. how can i so it's a slow pro process and I think by taking accountability, at least for me, it it kind of made me more empathetic. You know, I realized how hard it is to take accountability. Mm -hmm. And I could have just said, you know, I used to say, oh, I just don't like parties. I just don't like to go. Yeah, like, yeah. I just was nervous. That's the right. reality, right? And so when you realize that, oh, you know, 
those kind of ideas are going on in other people's heads. And so when they're struggling with something, it's not so cut and dry. Like there's a mm -hmm. lot of things that are going into place. And so I think that can help you understand that like whatever you're dealing with, someone else is dealing with either something similar or something different, but they're still suffering. Right. right? And so, and I think that if you look at the, it from the lens of, you know, human beings, as much as we are human, we are also biological creatures. We are sociological creatures. And so there is a sense of input output. And so if mm -hmm. I've had a life experience of, of trauma and difficulty, it's understandable that I, I'm not going to be maybe able to function like someone mm -hmm. else might. So right. that I think can help me help someone build more compassion for themselves mm -hmm. and also build more compassion for other people. You know? Yeah. I think you touched a little bit on, you know, when you said it, kind of like naming it, like your accountability, like, oh gosh, that's a problem if I can't go to the deli and order a sandwich. Yeah. And just, I think, verbalizing it and acknowledging it. Right. And I think, you know, facing it, facing yes. that fear, just naming it, just, you know, wrapping your head around it instead of like shoving it to the side and making excuses. I yeah. think that's the first step. I think in a lot of times is just acknowledging, hey, there's a problem. Right, right. And it's hard to do because I think it comes with shame, embarrassment. You know, you feel weak. You feel like, yeah, it's not what's wrong with me, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing to me, at least uh, with like courage and bravery, th that's not, courage is not doing something without fear, right? The courage is doing something in the face of fear. Right. If, if we all didn't have fear, like it, life would be really easy. And like, there would be nothing interesting or challenging about it. We'd also probably fall off cliffs a lot more, you know, like. You need some fear, right? But like right. you have to face it and say like, there's nothing embarrassing about feeling nervous. Mm -hmm. So you just say, okay, I feel this discomfort. And I think the other big thing was for me, especially with social anxiety, but I think you could apply this to anything is a feeling is not a fact. And right. while that doesn't mean we dismiss the feeling, we have to realize that I feel awkward, but that doesn't mean everyone around me thinks that I'm awkward. Right. They're not paying attention to me. Right. And if they are, <laughs> like, screw that. You know, like I, I might feel really, really uncomfortable, but once I get on a roll, once you start talking, you're just having a conversation. Right. Right. And so it's playing that out. So how do you, you know, you just talked about it a little bit, but how like somebody else, like how do you teach or guide or people to face their own fears? Like, yeah. and kind of get over that hump to be able to one, change the thoughts that, oh my gosh, everybody's looking at me, which in reality nobody really is and, and getting rid of some of those thoughts to be able to step into the moment and take charge. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. And it, 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 it looks different for everybody. What I like to do for people is uh, just to make it practical. I'll say, give me a one to 10 scale of your easiest task that you could mm -hmm. do that uh, has to do with something about in this case, social anxiety, but it could be a different sort of fear. And then give me your 10, which is like, mm -hmm. I, if that happened, I would have an absolute panic attack and I wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to have and then we say, okay, the ones are out and the tens are out. We're not dealing with those. Those are two right. either easy to hard. What's in the what's in the middle area? What's something you could do that you would feel good about, but would also, you know, would be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So you can start there. So in every one, it'll look different. For some people, it will be literally walking down the block. You know, mm -hmm. for some people when they have really bad social anxiety. Um, and then what I would say is, I think we, you know, we spend so much time in our head when we're anxious and we think that. If I just think about this problem long enough, I'll mm -hmm. get my solution mm -hmm. and this anxiety will go away. But often what that actually is, is you're looking for reassurance. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're going through a maze to try to figure out, okay, if I, if I say this, then that person will say that. And then I'll say that. And you're thinking about all these scenarios. Right. I think it's productive, but it's, it's actually not productive. Mm -hmm. And it's making your anxiety worse because you're looking for that reassurance. So I would say people can do is... Focus one on physically how you feel, that tension. Don't focus so much on what's in your mm -hmm. head right now. That's, I don't think, I think that's less relevant. And what's mm -hmm. more relevant is like, you just feel really uncomfortable. Your body is tight mm -hmm. and it's, and it, and it can't, it's stiff and you feel a knot in your chest and your, your stomach. So I would, I would recommend that people learn to sit with their discomfort and you can do this in imagine with imagination. You can just mm -hmm. imagine a, a stressful mm -hmm. situation feel the emotion come through and let it pass. And I, be, I believe that this isn't always the case, but I do believe if you let anxiety pass, that eventually it will mm -hmm. go to your head. It just re recycles, recycles. Yeah. I, I think about like how where emotions are 
just instinctive, you know, it's automatic emotions and they, if you really test it, they last like maybe 90 seconds. So what you're talking about is like sitting with your emotions yes. and just letting them ride out. It's the feeling that the rumination of those thoughts that keep it going. Yes. And that just goes and goes and goes and, and we can make it last a really long time right. and right. we can like increase the intensity of it, make it really bad. Yeah. And, and we'll just sit in that cycle. Yes. What we're talking about, what you're talking about is just kind of like, just allowing yourself to feel the emotion. Right. And, and don't try to escape it. Right. Cause yeah. that's what we do. Like I remember like with that speech class, I would escape mm -hmm. it. I yeah. would literally I'd feel anxious. I'd tell myself all the reasons why I shouldn't go or, and then I would just skip the class and then I escape and then I feel safe temporarily, but it doesn't help me. Yeah. So I would, I would say like the next time is like 10, like a little bit worse. Like, yeah. Oh, oh it was like, when I had to do it in senior year, I was like, oh my God, like I, it was, it was so much worse because now I had to do it. Yeah. Uh, but in a way I got, I think that helped me because I couldn't escape it. Mm -hmm. Basically I, I couldn't graduate. <laughs> So, Let me see. Do I you want to graduate that. or not? You know, yeah, I mean, no, no, just, sometimes how, get, how anxious really are you? you know? Yeah, we get like, stuck oh, in that corner, I right? Know, and it's it. like, oh, yeah. we just have to do it. Yes. But that is, it's just like we have to take some action. Yes. And hopefully it's that positive action and right. not that cope ex escaping, you know, yes. what it is. Yeah. And it's hard. It's, it's our instinct to escape, I think. Yeah. Because we, well, you know, we but, don't want to be uncomfortable. No, no. Ooh, <laughs> right, I can, Live you want to avoid life. that. <laughs> Not do anything challenging, and but and then I think you risk the the. I think that that's a risky road because mm -hmm. now, now you're complacent. You're not. You can't achieve the things you want to achieve. You can't because I think most people with social anxiety they're not necessarily introverted. A lot of them want very deeply social connection, and they're just not mm -hmm. getting it. So they're actually very unhappy, and but they try to convince themselves that no, I just don't. Eh, I don't like it. You know, it's gonna be boring. You know, right. They, they're not that cool. You know, there's people just think they're cool because they talk a lot, you know, but maybe you're just nervous, you know? Yeah. Admit that. yeah. So does this kind of apply to other, you know, anxieties that people might have as well? Cause we can, we can name different ones Sure. Right? sure. in general. Does I mean, is this, is it kind of like the same thing? Do you? Sure. I personally, my opinion is yes. And obviously there's, there's so many different types of therapy out there. Mm -hmm. The reason my personal opinion on that is if you're going to one type of therapist who does one thing and it's not working, go to a different, yeah. do, try something different. Like everyone is different. Nothing is going to work exactly the same for everyone. But I do believe that um, the more you challenge yourself, the, the, it's more about becoming more resilient to things in your life and mm -hmm. learning to challenge the anxiety. And I did this interesting, I took this interesting course on this new I guess it's relatively new. It's called ERP. It's exposure and response therapy. And they use it for OCD. Okay. And what's very unique about this therapy is what they teach is for the people with OCD, they say, you're going to learn to accept your thoughts. You're not going to challenge them. So if you have a thought, like if I don't scrub this, um, I'm going to get sick and then I'm going to pass it on to my partner and then they're going to get sick. And, and the OCD, um, uh, the ERP practitioner will say, yes, that could happen. Mm -hmm. Actually. Yeah, that could happen. You know, and that's hard for people to swallow. You have to do it gradually. Right. But the point is that, you know, the world is some a little dangerous. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, if you're someone who's socially anxious, I can't guarantee you that if you go to a social event that people won't judge you. And right. that you might make a, a joke that nobody thinks is funny and they might look at you like, well, that was weird. It might happen, you mm -hmm. know. So yeah. I think roll with it. Uh, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to say stupid things sometimes, but that's mm -hmm. okay. We all, yeah. You know. We've all done it and we've survived. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, it, it's always we, the pre that's worse than the post the post right because yeah. right, we our thoughts are great because we can think up yes. every scenario that might happen and you know what they could yes it, it could happen. it could honestly happen right the, right you know the percentage of it might happening might not be very big but it could happen it could happen right but we right. can't get stuff going and we and i think when people are afraid they get anxious about something might happen like oh that might happen yes it might happen that might happen yes yes but then we get into a really small place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's not too many things that are like, okay, then. Yes. Yeah. Which and is almost, that, that's essentially what agoraphobia is. Mm -hmm. Like, so agoraphobia is essentially fear of being outside, being in public, being in open spaces. And the way you described that was so interesting, right? It's like you get small, like your world literally gets small. Mm -hmm. 
So some people with agoraphobia, it'll be like, well, I can stay in this like four block radius, but if I go outside of that, it's mm -hmm. really bad. But then the more they stay at home, it gets closer, closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Closer. They can only stay in their house. Yeah. And it's, it's very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Because our, yeah. our brain is, can go different directions. But as soon as we close the door on our life because of our brains are like that, we yeah. can do the opposite. Yes, we can. We can slowly back open back up and like, mm -hmm. hey, it's not that bad. Like on that one, that one to scale, you know, one to 10 scale, you know, like, can you pick something a little challenging? Can we yes. do that? Yes. yes. You know, and then they survive. Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. and then they get a little bit more confidence. It's like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Like I could do that. Okay. What's the next thing? Yeah. Exactly. Right. It's just yeah. getting outside of our comfort zone just a little bit and realizing that these thoughts, you know, yeah, they could happen, but most of the time they're not. Yeah. Most of the time they're not. And then if, sometimes even if they do, they're not as bad as you think. True. True. Yeah, that often is the case too. Yeah, you know, and so, and you also like you can't live a life without doing it. You know, it's kind of like yeah, like you said that you close in, and so if you if you don't do those things, and you don't, you're not living in a sense. You're not, um, and that's why I think there's such a correlation between anxiety and depression because mm -hmm. in order to, I forget who it was, is a psychologist who said one way of looking at depression is you can't think of a future. Basically, right. you perceive the future, and if you're anxious the future only looks grim, right? right? Doesn't, right. there's no, po there's no potential. Yeah. Like, like you said, it's like, yeah, you, um, you have to realize you can open the door mm -hmm. and there's potential through, through that. Yeah. And so anxiety and depression often go hand in hand Yes. because I want to say one will, you know, cause the other or anything, but it's just that when we think about how anxiety can keep us in, yeah. In reality, we're social beings, yes. so we don't want to be by ourselves. Right. And so then if we are by ourselves, yeah. that exactly. can, that can cause that depression to come out. Yeah. And so can you, is there like, like two or three things that you talk about a lot and like with a lot of people that is just generally, you know, let's do this to be able to help ease the anxiety, get out of depression. Yeah. Do you have a couple things that are your key things to go to? Sure, sure. I think the first thing is be careful how you talk to yourself mm -hmm. because, you know, depression is a little prank, little trickster, and it likes to convince you that you're this awful thing mm -hmm. that is useless and you can't do anything. And I always, my, you know, I'll have a client tell me something and I'll say, I want you to imagine, say what you just said. I want you to imagine that saying that to your best friend. Yeah. Right. I'm worthless. I'm a piece of shit. I'm useless. Nobody wants me around. Sorry. Right. I can't. Do no, that's okay. <laughs> But, you know, that all that whole narrative, which is very common. Mm -hmm. And um, what I find is that uh, people are generally much more empathetic to others mm -hmm. than they are to themselves. Yeah. And um, that is the first thing I think that needs to change. Like, mm -hmm. because you, a, as you go through this process of challenging yourself, you're going to fail many times. And so if your narrative is, oh, look, I failed again you're going to continue that. This is why I think people are the hardest thing is the motivation because mm -hmm. you make a small progress and then you make a mistake, you fall back. And then you mm -hmm. make a yeah. and it's this narrative. See, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is why I don't do it. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's the number one thing is like, I talk to yourself. Like you talk to a friend, be kind mm -hmm. to yourself. Yeah. Uh, because, and it's hard because you have so many emotions and you feel like, Oh, I'm, I'm doing the easy way out. Right. I'm, I'm, this is a cop out. Well, the cop out's the only thing that works. Right. So, Try, you can you can be mean to yourself if you want. It's not going to work. You know, it's not it's not going to work. So that that's the first thing I would say. And um, yeah, I think just being, I guess, along those lines, being reasonable with your expectations, whatever your challenge is, whether it's social anxiety, whether it's mm -hmm. like you said, making making friends as an adult, especially, is hard. Mm -hmm. You're out of college, and a lot of people are working from home now. Mm -hmm. It's hard to make friends if that's you know if you're like you were mentioning before. There's this this yo-yo in between anxiety and depression we feel anxious then we withdraw then we feel isolated mm -hmm. lack of loneliness then we feel depressed mm -hmm. it's a very hard cycle so um i would look for situate like just practically speaking go to social events that force people to be social so for example like you know if you go to the movies or you go to like a, a the, the museum like yeah let me you'll have a nice time you might have a nice time but nobody's talking really right. yeah to you. So I would go to a place where it's forced conversation. Like in the, uh, in New York, where I am, they have a lot of these like uh, not like 
recreational kickball leagues and stuff. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're like 30 years old, but they, they're not going to play kickball. They're going in to have a couple of drinks and have a good time. And yep. so go somewhere where everyone is there to socialize so that you don't, especially if you have social anxiety, that way you don't feel like awkward mm-hmm. in the sense you feel like you're stepping on anyone's toes or overburdening anyone. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. there for the same purpose. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So a joint venture, you know, kind of a similar yeah. activity, a similar activity that involves something that gets movement. Well, not necessarily movement all the time, but something gets you engaged with other people in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So movies, no library, no, you know, museums, you got to stay quiet. Most of the time, right. it's not a chatter right. place. Right. So something that involves a little bit more, um, I would say activity because there is a lot of those adult leagues of some sort of sports, yes. right? You love you, you're a sports fan, right. you know, it doesn't have to be that right? people that know me. Yeah. We're all into sports. It doesn't have to be that, but find your hobby, find yeah. your interest that allows that communication allows that interaction with others. Right. Exactly. And, and I think it, it makes the socializing easier because you know, a lot of times, if, if, if you, especially if you're anxious, you know, eye contact can be tricky in the beginning. It'd be hard mm-hmm. in the beginning. Forced small talk can be hard. If you're engaged in something, and this is another kind of thought experiment I have people imagine. Most people who are socially anxious. They at least can talk to a few people in their life. Mm-hmm. So I'll ask them, like, well, think of a conversation you have with like your best friend or your or your your mom or your brother or sister. What do you feel then? And it's like, oh, we're just, they're just talking, Mm -hmm. right? They're not in their head because it's just a conversation because they're not worried about the perception. And so it's like, well, that's how all conversations could theoretically be if you didn't focus so much in here and you look outward. So if you're doing an activity, you're not as much in your head because you're Mm -hmm. doing stuff and you're out. And so it's just kind of more free flowing typically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, this has been great, Charles. You know, there's so many things out there that we can talk to uh, talk about and <laughs> we could go on. Yeah, but where could listeners find out more about you, how to get a hold of you if they want to? Sure. Uh, so th- thanks again for this. Um, I have a website. It's just charlesperrytherapy.com. And uh, Charles Perry Therapy is also my Instagram handle. So you can find me on there. Those are my two main things. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can you can reach out. You can email me. Um, but thank you again for, for having me on this. Definitely. Yeah. I'll put the links in the show notes so people can easily, you know, find you. Sure. And so as we wrap up today, is there one thing or a thought or a quote that you would like to leave listeners with? Sure. Yes. And I, I maybe I apologize if I'm uh, repeating myself. Okay. But I would say, talk to yourself like a friend. Mm-hmm. Talk to yourself like a friend. I think that really can get you through so much because so much of what stops us is our narrative and our internal dialogue. And if that's bad, uh, we can't even start. Right. You know? So, uh, so there was this interesting study, not to, not to French talk, but they, they had people, they said, okay, I want you to write down your thoughts and take your name out, take the I out, take, yeah. the e out, take your name out, put on a fictional character. And they found that those people, their brain reacted differently. They didn't have an emotional pull. And so when they read the story back, they could see like, oh, wow, that person's had a tough life or that, that, that must've been hard. Mm-hmm. But when they do it for themselves, they, they can't, uh, they can't do that. They're too caught up in their emotions. So, right. so I would say, yeah, try to be kinder to yourself, you know? Yeah. Be kind to yourself and talk to yourself. Like you would talk to a loved one or yes. a friend. Yes. Awesome. Great advice. Thank you so much for being here, Charles. Appreciate you. you stepping in today and sharing some words of wisdom. Thank you. Appreciate it.